everybody, and welcome to our interview today with Diana Kermanski. If you missed her talk last night, you can watch it on our National Conservation Training Center Facebook page uh, by going to our news feed or looking at the videos. Um, I, for that, I want to give a shout out to the friends of NCTC who co-sponsor our lecture series. And I want to thank the behind the scenes crew that make all this virtual magic happen today's session. Thanks to Melissa Gonzalez, Randy Robinson, and Rob Garfinkel. So um, I am Maria Parisi. I'm the Heritage Partnership Coordinator at the National Conservation Training Center. And we're here today with Diana Fermansky for this uh, interview. She's joining us from Arizona. Um, I'll give an introduction to Diana, then she'll get a chance to say hello. And then I will ask Diana some questions and we'll go through that for a little while with Q and A's. And then anytime you wish to add your own questions, you can add a question in the comments on the Facebook page. And Randy is gonna assist at the end. Uh, so we share your questions before we need to wrap up today. So uh, let me introduce Diana to you. Diana is an award-winning author and journalist. Her articles have appeared in the New York Times, Audubon, High Country News, American Heritage, Harrow Smith, Wilderness, and other publications. Her book, These American Lands, is a narrative history of public lands of the American West. In her book, Rosalie Edge, Hawk of Mercy, the Anna passionately recovers the recovers the story of the once famous indomitable woman who protected raptors from slaughter and who deserves much of the credit for awakening the public's environmental consciousness in the mid 20th century. Diana has also, also wrote about Rosalie Edge for our just released conservation history journal with its theme of women in conservation history. You can learn more about Rosalie and a host of other conservation heroes from the late 1800s to today and you can find our journal online, and I'll read you that URL. It's nctc.fws.gov slash history. So we're pleased, too, to bring Diana with us today, 100 years after Congress ratified the 19th Amendment, granting women the right to vote. Uh, Diana, I'm turning this over to you. Um, let's, do, uh, let's give you a chance to say hello, and then we'll start with our first question. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us again online or for the first time to celebrate um, the convergence of two important social movements of the 20th century, the suffrage movement and the conservation movement. And Rosalie Edge is the very important link between those two movements. Yeah. So, um, Diana, we often start out our interviews with authors asking, how did you get interested in the topic? And so for today, for today, we're curious, how did you get interested in writing about Rosalie Edge? And for the folks that uh, may be joining us today for the first time and didn't see let the talk last night, as you speak, um, we'd like to get an introduction of who, who was Rosalie Edge? So thank you. Thank you. Um, Rosalie Edge is a once famous, um, now almost forgotten heroine in conservation between the eras of John Muir and Rachel Carson. She picked up where John Muir left off, although uh, it was some years after his death. She burst upon the scene in 1929, uh, some years after her career, uh, volunteer career as a suffragist ended in success. Uh, and she linked John Muir to Rachel Carson through the expansion of a conservation um, ethic that spread through the country, and and she was a she was called the most honest, uh, in, uh, unselfish, indomitable Hellcat in the history of conservation. Uh, she had many many successes. She was well known. Um, she was the person who reported on what was going on in a conservation movement that she felt had been corrupted and had grown sluggish in the aftermath of the Muir dynamism of pre park creation and the, the Roosevelt days. And she picked up that and carried it um, to the point where Rachel Carson uh, rises um, on her own very fine merits and um, uses 
information from Rosalie Edge's Hawk Mountain Sanctuary, the first place in the world to provide uh, protection for raptors. Um, Rachel Carson re uses the data from Rosalie Edge's Hawk Mountain Sanctuary for proving that DDT has a very bad effect on um, the migration numbers every year. So that was the link between those two women. Rachel Carson eclipses Rosalie Edge. Rachel Carson was a scientist. She was well respected and she was a much easier person to like, which is not a small statement when a woman is trying to go against the, men, the male establishment as Rosalie Edge was trying to do. So um, we have two women really who were converging um, and brought much to the um, understanding of conservation. And I, I got into it because I was writing a book about public land history my, uh, in the 80s. My editor on that book mentioned, I, I'd come across the name Rosalie Edge in just one or two books. And I mentioned it to my editor, um, the late T.H. Watkins, who wrote the definitive biography of Harold Ickes, uh, for anyone who's interested in following that storyline. Um, and um, I said, I can't believe I've never heard of this woman. So a few years go by, and my editor, Tom, calls me and he says, guess what? Uh, Rosalie Edge's conservation papers, you mentioned her in your book, you, you thought of her a few years ago, I'd never heard of her either, but she actually has quite a collection of conservation papers, the Denver Public Library. And I was living near Denver in those days, and um, um, he said, check her out which I did. And I spent the next few years visiting the collection at the Denver Public Library's Conservation Library, which was the first conservation library in the country. And Rosalie Edge's conservation papers from all her battles were one of its foundation stones. Um, so it was convenient, I have to say, uh, in some ways. And I would sneak in the research um, between other tasks and uh, eventually, I came across the fact that her son, the late Peter Edge, was alive, and I spoke to him many times, and he finally agreed to um, tell me about his mother and to open up lots of sources that had been previously closed. So I spent quite a few years collecting that and tracking down uh, people who knew Rosalie Edge. Um, and I spoke to quite a few people um, at length or briefly, um, and all of them who said that as difficult as she was, she was um, a tour de force and someone worth remembering. I think I have lost somebody. Uh, Diana, I believe we lost the audio. There's Maria. Okay. She's back. Okay. When was so how how okay, we can pick up. Yes, can you, you all hear me? I can hear you. Great, because I also lost the sound, so I missed what the last words that you were sharing. And I was reflecting that when we asked our introductory question. I thought there's so much there to unpack in the time we have. So I'm sorry, having missed what you said, I'm gonna go on to the next question and hope we just kind of catch up and it flows. So uh, I, there's so much to talk about. Um, one of the things we mentioned yesterday after the, the talk last night was kind of how did, how did this New York socialite get involved? So uh, let's go back a little bit to her uh, initial background and then the incidents that occurred that she got involved in suffrage in the first place. Can you talk about that? Okay. Uh, Rosalie Edge was not a scientist. She had not been raised to uh, appreciate nature other than what she came across as a child in Central Park. She was the, uh, a, a, a child of the Gilded Age from a wealthy family. Uh, she was the first cousin to Charles Dickens. Her father was British. Uh, her mother was an old so Dutch family um, settlement in, in New York, New Amsterdam. 
And she was raised to uh, be a very privileged young child. She was doted upon by her father who died at the, when she was eight and it left her um, bereft and also not as well off financially as she thought or the family thought they would have been. Um, so she is very intelligent. She's um, not a college educated woman. There was no need for someone of her class to go to college, but she was very well educated and spoke several languages, read a great deal, was very familiar with the classic literature, particularly her, um, her cousin Charles Dickens. She could quote him at length. Um, and uh, that was her background. She married Charles Noel Edge. Um, she was Mar Mabel Barrow was her maiden name. She marries Charles Noel Edge in about 1909. She pursues him to uh, Japan where he is working as an engineer. Uh, and she marries him against her mother's wishes at the late age of about 32. She travels through um, Asia and there's really very, very little she shows of interest in nature. It's, it's not, and she returned, and she's not interested in suffrage as far as we can confirm. And it's not until she gets back to the United States in um, 1913, uh, 15, that she becomes interested in the suffrage movement, which of course is ramping up in New York State. Um, and also uh, it's been active in, in the England where she was living for a while. So she becomes a suffragist based on an interaction she has on the return voyage from England. She's um, eight months pregnant with uh, her first son, Peter, the one I uh, interviewed, and she meets the mother of a suffragette from England. The daughter of the suffragette was supposed to have joined her parents on this trip to America, but what do you know, she was in prison for setting fire to uh, mailboxes in England, which was a common suffragette tactic there. So she was in prison, but the mother, Lady Rhonda, is telling Rosalie Edge about what her daughter has been doing. And Rosalie Edge is inspired. She's eight months pregnant. She's not gonna act quickly. Uh, it's actually two years later, 1915, after the birth of her second daughter, when she reads in May of 1915 that the um, Lusitania had been torpedoed by the Germans uh, during World War I before the United States entered the war. And one of the uh, primary survivors, one of the most famous survivors of that, uh, of that tragedy was this Margaret Rhonda, the daughter that had been in prison uh, that Rosalie Edge had met her mother on a previous voyage and Lady Rhonda was rescued from the waters and she was most famous as this rabid suffragette. Her saving it rem reminded Rosalie Edge that she had gotten interested and she wanted to pursue it. And that's when she dropped everything and joined the suffrage movement in 1915. Thank you. And I want to get to then, how did she get involved in nature? Oh, you have something else? Yeah, I wanted to mention that um, I have here from her, from her um, uh, papers and some of the things that she saved, the actual banner that she wore when she was marching in the streets of New York. This was the classic women's suffrage banner. And they wore like this across their chests. And then they had a back banner that looked like this. So she became a woman in the streets marching with thousands of women, uh, probably millions across the country, but she was active in New York. She was on the, um, the, the New York suffrage board under Carrie Chapman Catt. Um, and uh, the photo that you're showing is the first time the White House was picketed in 1917. Uh, the suffragettes, the suffragists were the first people to picket the White House. Um, it had not been done before they did it. And now we see other kinds of uh, tragic pickets in front of the White House. But this was the original attempt uh, to, to get the attention of the White House to back women's suffrage. And they finally did get that. So um, that was her suffrage life. Uh, she becomes 
she, the, the, the right uh, to vote in 19th Amendment is passed and uh, is ratified in, in uh, 1920, uh, August 1920, where we celebrated the 100th ratification of the 19th Amendment, uh, the wording of which says, the right of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of sex. So that's the wording of the 19th Amendment. It gets uh, ratified by the 36 states that are needed to ratify it uh, by August of 1920. And Rosalie Edge dives then into birds. She starts watching birds with a passion but she also describes the experience as a way for her to find solace from deep sadness, which is a personal thing, getting back to the point that for her, politics was personal. Something happens in her marriage to make her seek solace uh, from nature. And she is very, very quickly um, taken up with the plight of, of birds, particularly raptors, who really have no defenders uh, in those days. They were not popular. Uh, even the Audubon Society had um, uh, no, no interest in championing their causes. Uh, eagles were on the brink of extinction. Whooping cranes were on the brink of extinction. Ivory-billed woodpeckers, uh, I guess, are extinct. There are some rumors about that. You guys would know better. Uh, so the, the Ottoman society really wasn't talking too much about preserving all, um, all of these species. So she becomes their, their spokesman um, because she's so angry. She's so angry about the neglect of these birds. Thank you, Diana. There are so many directions we could go next. And so bridging the suffrage and the personalist political and her approach, would you take a moment and read a sample of one of Rosalie Edge's suffrage pamphlets? And so we can get, and, and from one of her later conservation pamphlets to show her combative prose style. Yes, okay. Um, she was an, uh, a secretary treasurer of the New York State Suffrage Party. And she was also on their pamphleteering committee. It was their press committee. It's where she learned how to write uh, incendiary, outrageous pamphlets. So let me read an example from a suffrage pamphlet that was, I think, in like 1916. It was called, um, Why Not? Big question mark. In the United States, all men are allowed to vote. Why not women? Own, women can own property and are taxed the same as men are. Why not let them have representation? Women make the home. They care more about it than men do because it is their business. Why not let them vote? Why not let them have something to say about laws which protect the home? Women take care of children. They are held responsible for their welfare. Why not let them have something to say about the laws which govern the food, the clothing, schools, and playgrounds for children? These things are largely a question of voting. Over 2 million children are at work in mills, shops, and factories. Why not let women vote on this? That is a typical Rosalie Edge statement. Um, I will read now from um, one which she writes later in the same tone against the Bureau of Biological Survey which is um, an agency that precedes the Fish and Wildlife Service that was um, interested in things like quantifying the value of species. So a pheasant was worth something, but a bald eagle really wasn't. And uh, they had massive poisoning programs. So one of her pamphlets, years after her suffrage writing, goes like this. It's called, um, uh, let's see, it is called the United States Bureau of Biological Survey, destruction, not scientific investigation and conservation is now its chief activity. And this is what she wrote in about 1931. Would the public approve or enjoy an attempt to rid the country of criminals and undesirable citizens by poisoning the food in the markets 
and grocery stores. That is the way the wildlife of this country is being treated for reasons that will not bear investigation. The biological survey's demands for appropriations are based on figures implying that 2 million young cattle, horses, sheep, and hogs are killed by wolves, mountain lions, coyotes, etc., in the United States every year. That is 5,479 a day. Do you believe such absurd nonsense? So you can see um, that the, the manner of writing uh, is similar in her suffrage pamphlets and then how she takes on uh, major conservation organizations within the federal government and uh, private groups like the Audubon Society, where she questions their loyalty, their understanding of the need for all species to survive. Thank you. We have quite a history and Rosalie was part of that. Uh, could you elaborate a little bit on her tactics uh, heading to Washington, D.C., um, how she lobbied, uh, what that was like in terms of the wildlife refuge system? Uh, can you share a little more about her approach? Sure. She, um, she is considered the first lobbyist uh, in that she would go to Washington, D.C. on her own dime. She was never paid to do this. And she would go office to office and she would uh, confront the, um, the congressmen, the ones who were on or were open to her message and the ones who weren't. Um, she would testify in Congress where it was very unusual for her to show up. They didn't quite know what she was doing there since she really had no job or credentials. She was simply an activist. Um, her, her, her reputation as, as a suffragist was something that people criticized because it made her very um, unfeminine. Uh, I don't remember the exact words, but she was dismissed for her, for her brazenness. Um, she would also write and uh, have meetings with Secretary of Interior Harold Ickes who liked the fact that she would stir up the grassroots. She would let them know what the agencies were doing and uh, when they were not protecting the, the uh, wildlife or uh, the, the forests or the national parks, which were in his domain, um, any of the public lands. And then it allowed Harold Ickes to present um, policies and he would point to the the, the work of the grassroots and how much support she was generating. Her pamphlets, which uh, I think there were about a million at one uh, total that she published uh, on a shoestring uh, from contributions uh, made to her committee, the Emergency uh, Conservation Committee in the 1930s. And these pamphlets inspired, educated, aroused, angered lots of people who might not otherwise have been um, aware of what was going on. So she understood the value of, of creating a grassroots movement. And I think that that was an important contribution she made to conservation. She also didn't have many people to compete with. Lobbying then was not what it is today. Um, she also used Hawk Mountain Sanctuary after its establishment as the first uh, raptor refuge in the whole world. And it is now a standard in the world. But she used that as her uh, soapbox, which is a term we get from the suffrage movement because as a suffragist, she did uh, speak on a soapbox as did many of the women uh, to be heard better, to, to raise them perhaps above the heads of men uh, who were most of the people out and about in the business sections of New York. Um, and, and she wrote, she spoke, she testified, she raised money, she campaigned, and she did none of it. She never was paid a cent. She was a full-time volunteer. That last piece is also really striking when you think about all that she did in her legacy uh, and I, I said this with others, I get chills every time you pull that session out. <laughs> um, uh, one of the questions we received was um, a, someone noticed the dragonfly pin that Rosalie wears in the photos we've been sharing and the dragonfly on my wall. So somebody made that yeah. connection. So 
Would you, would you tell us about that dragonfly fly pin? Yes, well, um, I don't think it's, um, I think it's an interesting thing that uh, through women, the stories evolve in different ways. And in the 1930s, when Rosalie Edge launched her campaign to save uh, mostly uh, birds, but she was wanting to protect habitats as well and other wildlife, she and her son Peter drove west from New York to see the national parks. Um, and they got as far as Santa Fe, New Mexico, where she um, bought the pin, the dragonfly pin that she is wearing. And, and in this photo of her with the uh, red tail hawk on, on her arm uh, and the dragonfly pin, which is a silver with turquoise uh, in it. And um, that pin was, has become really her emblem besides the hawk on her arm. Her granddaughter, Dr. Deborah Edge, now wears that pin. Um, and it has become a very special emblem. And of course, it is a, um, an important symbol of the arid West uh, because the dragonfly is, a, is an important uh, symbol to Native Americans uh, because it's a sign that there is water nearby. So it was wonderful to see that you know, with no planning at all, uh, we have a dragonfly on your wall as well. Thank you for, <laughs> for having that. Yeah. Yeah, that's kind of fun. Um, we want to just give a reminder to folks who are watching on Facebook that if you have comments or questions, we'll have a little bit of time as we wrap up to, to share those. Um, I, I want to make sure, because uh, Diana and I talked ahead of this, is you know some of the points that I want to make sure Diana gets a chance to cover. And so I'll ask if you want to elaborate, Diana, any more on a couple of the themes, kind of uh, the personal is political, and more about her personal life and how she brought herself. And, and you've mentioned some of this already. I just want to give an opportunity if you wish to elaborate on that. Yes, uh, she brought to this fight what she had. And the main thing was a terrible sense of, of betrayal and distrust. And it had to do with the breakdown of her marriage to Charles Noel Edge. Um, which it's nine, in the 1920s, really right at the end of the suffrage movement, uh, she, her marriage dissolved. She was absent, I have to say, through the last few years of her marriage because of her suffrage fight. And she did have the wherewithal to have uh, nannies for her children. So she was not a hands-on mother. So she was out campaigning for women. And in the meantime, uh, there was uh, probably infidelity, uh, it's, not, it's not completely clear, but there are some letters in her files that indicate that um, her husband had a girlfriend, and this destroyed her, um, and it made her feel like, wait a minute, who's, who's, who's protecting me? She's done this fight for women's rights, but she's still dependent on her husband for her income and for her wealth. Uh, because she did expect to be wealthy. And um, there is this terrible explosion in about 1920, 21. She leaves Charles Edge uh, with her two children. Their chauffeur drives them from their beach house in, uh, on, on Long Island Sound back to their brownstone on the Upper East Side in New York. And she and Charles never live together again. Um, she never grants him a divorce. She never wants him to be free to marry the other person. Uh, but if it's possible, uh, if we have time, Maria, I'd like to read a poem that she wrote. She was a poet. She was actually uh, published for her uh, in the Christian Science Monitor and other newspapers, Saturday, Night, Saturday Evening Review, and some uh, nature magazines. Her poetry is quite beautiful. And she won an award uh, for her poetry uh, however, it was, it was taken back when it was realized that she was not a full-time student at the age of 67, uh, so they would not let her um, uh, keep this poetry award that was so uh, important. But here's an example. It was at Columbia University. She was a um, night student studying uh, literature. Anyway, at, while she's a conservationist, while she's working in conservation, she's trying to improve her pamphleteering. But here's a poem that she wrote. 
to which we can read in the kind of pain that she felt. Your love is swept with stinging lash of rain torrential with the crash of thunder with fierce lightning flash of bolt that severed with one gash the all pervading mists. Again, the temple veil was rent with twain. Your love, it was storm driven rain reverberating with the pain of revelation. Since that long night, forever blinded with the sight of space uprolled to timeless height, made plain in one zigzag of light. I have to mention that her husband, Charles, was six foot eight. And there are indications and memories that he actually um, broke her arm in this incident that she's writing about as a poem. She's never quite, she, she, she's vague about what actually happened, but there are people who recall something like that, including her son. Um, so she ended up in a cast. Maybe her arm wasn't broken, we'll never know. But that pain of that violence against her, I think, helped her identify with the plight of these most despised birds. And she felt that she knew what it was like to feel rejected, betrayed, despised. And she um, identified with these hawks and eagles who were being slaughtered by the thousands um, every year uh, with no one to stand up and say, you know what, this is really not the right thing to do. Not even the, the Audubon Society in those days was up for that. This picture is from Hawk Mountain Sanctuary uh, before it became a sanctuary. Uh, after the fall migration uh, or during the fall migration, hunters would go to the Kittanini Ridge in that area uh, of the Appalachians where the, the hawks would, uh, the winds would carry them and they would migrate in the thousands um, in the fall. And uh, that's where she went to make her soapbox uh, on Hawk Mountain, on Hawk Mountain, to turn it into a sanctuary to stop the killing and to spread that message uh, across the world, of course, starting in the United States. But this is an annual um, thing uh, to see. We now know that there are larger um, rivers of hawks in other parts of the world, but she called out this one and had it preserved. She bought it for $500 depression time. She borrowed the money, she never paid it back. And that's why Rachel Carson goes to Hawk Mountain Sanctuary to, to collect her data because it was the only place in the world where they were counting hawks uh, every day and, and eagles every day uh, to just keep track of the migration. And lo and behold, it began to plummet in the 40s. And that's when we start learning about uh, the possibility of DDT's implication. Um, and I think, let's see, where, where else was I going with that? Um, well, I guess that says it about the personal becoming political, yes. So the, the, the poem is an example of the kind of passion that she felt and what it led her to do next. Thank you. Uh, Randy and uh, Melissa are helping me in the background. We do have some questions coming in that we want to get to. Um, Randy, uh, if you're on audio, uh, would you share the first question? Sure, we have a question from Janet. When you refer to Rosalie launching her campaign, did she have an overall strategy mapped out with specific objectives, actions, et cetera, that comprised that campaign? The first thing she did was march into the, um, the Audubon Society's annual meeting on October 28th or so, 1929, which also is the date of the stock market crash. Um, she goes to the meeting for the first time. She's a member of the Audubon Society, but she hadn't really uh, paid much attention uh, to what was going on there. She assumed that she supported all of its actions and she really hadn't given it much thought. Again, it was a momentary flash of insight when she was um, informed 
that about 70,000 bald eagles had been um, killed for bounty money in Alaska, in the, in the territory of Alaska, and it angered her immediately. It was an instant of, I can't let this happen. And that's really how she puts it. Uh, and then she goes to the Audubon meeting and she begins to question them. She stands up at meeting, but let me describe overall how she said what her platform was, how she would do it. She would go into these meetings where they were all men and they were, as she said, patting themselves on the back for the money that they had raised, for you know the birds they had seen. And there was no mention of the destruction of, of the uh, eagle pop, bald eagle population. So she said what they needed to do, what she needed to do was what she had done as a suffragist. When we suffrage women attacked political, a, a political machine languid with overfeeding, slumbering in action, we called out its name and we called out the names of its officers so that all could hear. We got ourselves inside the recalcitrant organization if possible and stood up at all their meetings. We gave the matter to the press first to do something to make sure that we would be making news. So the way she got into this organization, she was already a member. She was a life member. She um, demanded the mailing list from the Audubon Society's membership so that she could inform the members all directly about some of the things the Audubon Society had been up to. There was a suit. Um, <clears throat> she hired a lawyer because the Audubon Society did not turn over their mailing list of members uh, willingly. And their membership at that time was about 8,500. Uh, she won the suit as a member, and that was a way that she got into an organization. She became a member of it, and then she was able to question it from the inside. So the Ottoman Society was her first major um, enemy, her attack. She, she took them on, and um, she won the suit. Their membership plummeted to about 3,000. And her membership of the in, in, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, Emergency Conservation Committee grew because people saw that she was willing to, to, to say truth to power, an expression we use today, and they wanted to support what she did. And that eventually spread so that she had allies, including um, Aldo Leopold, uh, Bob Marshall, um, uh, Dean Darling uh, from the Biological Surveys, one of their one of last directors, um, the, the best and the brightest who were reformers in the field, who were wilderness advocates, they joined Rosalie Edge uh, in the background. They let her speak. They, they educated her because she did not have a formal education. And she listened to the most progressive thinkers. And then she would take what they said and, and, and put it out for the public. Um, I wanted to, if we have time, is there time? Yes. There was something else I wanted to read to show how quickly she would act on things. She was um, spontaneous in, in many ways. Um, let me see. One second. Well, I'm find it. Well, okay. If you have another question, let's go on, and I'll try to find it while you're while I'm looking at it. Yeah. Okay. Another question. Yes, I'm going to turn it to Randy for a final question, and then after that, uh, Diana, turn to what you find, and we'll kind of close with uh, your commentary on her legacy. Okay. All right. So, uh, yeah. so why and how did she purchase, did Rosalie purchase Hawk Mountain? Did she have other contributors? Did she do it on her own? How did that happen? And in what year? Was that during the Depression? Yes. She goes to Hawk Mountain for the first time, I think, in the 1934, 35, during the Depression. It's a 
used piece of land. There's um, cartridge shells all over the mountaintop from the Hunter's uh, Fall campaign. It had been used for logging and mining, but it had been abandoned. And um, she puts an offer on it, I believe, for $500. Now, one thing about Rosalie Edge, even though she was a well-off woman and her, her estranged husband continued to support her for the rest of his life, um, she never spent her own money. Uh, she didn't think that she needed to do that, given that she put in her whole life. So she asked uh, William, uh, a, 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 an ornithologist, um, who was her supporter and educator, Willard Van Name, who worked for the American Museum of Natural History, who had been ostracized for his unusual views about uh, protecting hawks and eagles. And he gave her a loan of $500 to buy the uh, land that she needed. Uh, I forget the acreage, it's now something like a total of 2,500 acres, but then it was a smaller part. And he gave her the money, it was understood to be a loan, but he later um, dismissed the loan and it was a gift. And then the rest of the Hawk Mountain Sanctuary and whatever funds she needed to maintain it were all uh, small contributions. I did find, yes, I, I did find uh, something I can close with, um, which again is a personality of who she is and how she got started. She receives this information about how terrible the killing of hawks and eagles is. And she's in France with her children uh, in 1929, summer of 1929. She reads this article about the lack of action. And she says now, before me now is a vision of my bedroom in the French hotel, hung and upholstered in brocade, as the Parisians do in their kindly effort to persuade one that a bedroom is also a drawing room. I paced up and down, heedless that my family was waiting to go to dinner. For what to me were dinner and the boulevards of Paris, when my mind was filled with the tragedy of beautiful birds disappearing through the neglect and indifference of those who had at their disposal wealth beyond avarice with which these creatures might be saved. Thank you again, Diana. Uh, let me give Randy one more quickie check-in as we're wrapping up, if there were any other final questions, otherwise uh, we'll do our closing. Uh, so Randy, anything new or can we wrap up? Nothing in the chat room. So thank you very much. Okay, thank I you. guess I have, a, I have a final question and it has to do with the shameless plug for the journal. Can you speak just very briefly about DDT. In the journal, we have your author, your article, your essay about Rosalie. We have an essay about Dr. Lucille Stickle, and then we have an essay about Rachel Carson. So uh, can you speak for the conservation folks listening a little bit more about Rosalie's uh, role around DDT and how she was a player in that? How, how, does Ro how does Rachel Carson stand on the shoulders of Rosalie when it comes to um, that piece of, of our history? The main way Rose, Rachel Carson stands on Rosalie Edge's shoulders is in the fact that Hawk Mountain Sanctuary provided the early data, very significant data, to show that year after year after year, the um, hawk and eagle migration had been a certain level, and then it began going down, 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 down to a, a low point. And uh, that was those were hard numbers that nobody else had. And it was Rosalie Edge's insistence from the moment that Hawk Mountain opened in the 1930s that there, there would be a bird count for these birds that had only been counted when they were killed, you know, the number of birds died. So um, in that sense, Rosalie Edge contributed in an indirect way by providing the data. Um, I did find a letter from Rachel Carson to Maurice Brun, who ran the Hawk Mountain Sanctuary and reported to Rosalie Edge about um, those, those numbers. Rachel Carson is, act, is asking for Maurice Brun to provide Hawk Mountain Sanctuary's numbers because um, she has a, a, a feeling that uh, there has been some um, connection to the, the migration decline. 
and I'll just start a little bit. She writes to Maurice Brood at Hawk Mountain Sanctuary. This is from Rachel Carson, May 13th, 1960. Uh, and she says, as you may possibly have heard from some of our friends in conservation, I am writing a book that will explore some of the effects of chemical pesticides, especially their ecological effects. I'm wondering if you can provide uh, data on, uh, I see that you, I have seen you quote at various times to the effect that you are now seeing very few imm immature eagles in the fall migration over Hawk Mountain. Would you be so kind to write me your comments on this with any details and figures that you think are significant? Um, so she's beginning to collect her information. Rosalie Edge also contacted local fish and game departments in New York to report on the number of dead birds uh, that were being found on golf, golf courses, uh, in particular in Westchester, where they were spraying uh, DDT. And it was, it was anecdotal, it was a theory, it wasn't proven, but she did call it out when she saw it or when she got it reported to her. And uh, because of her standing, her stature, and the, the fact that the fish and wildlife people were onto it, um, they responded. So she, she added to the information that was out there. Um, and her previous campaign against uh, poisoning made her very committed to watching for that sort of thing. Thank you, Diana, for telling us the story of Rosalie Edge. Uh, I think given that she lived uh, some time ago, there's a lot of folks who, uh, including me, when I started down this path with the journal that did not know about Rosalie Edge. So very grateful for you for telling that story. And we're kind of at time here. I want to thank everybody who joined us in the audience. This will be recorded. You can come back uh, and, and see it again. And I encourage you to see the journal and uh, Diana has resources. Uh, I'll give you the closing words, Diana, and then we'll go off air. So uh, back to you. Okay, thank you very much for this opportunity. Um, also, I want to encourage people to go visit Hawk Mountain Sanctuary. It's a close place to go for people who are limited in their travels. It's a beautiful place to go any time of year. The migration still draw draws crowds. Um, and um, be mindful of the importance of the, of the ongoing fight to vote. I think that by voting, we can continue to protect wildlife in America and other values that we hold dear. And we thank our suffrage uh, forebears for making it possible today. Uh, so thank you again, all my friends at Fish and Wildlife Service and the friends of the NCTC. Sorry, I didn't get to meet you in person. Uh, but next time, thank you again. Thank you, Diana. And we will say farewell to everybody. See you later on yes. Facebook. Bye.